Look. He doesn't have a brother named Zach. Oh, he oh was good. A good man lived. You're that, Joe? I think that was the best reaction I've ever seen in the summer. He's right here! He's right here! <laughs> and he ain't going nowhere. Uh, great, 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 great grandfather. Six greats. Is that cool, dude? How does it make you feel? You didn't get the his initial reaction, did you? And, and awesome. Yeah. 78. Wow. Oh, he was good. Look at that. Good, good man lived. So you want me to tell you a little bit about your great, 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 great grandpa? Yeah. All right, so Martin Horton Peck, he is the first person in our family to join the church. So he was born in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, and his ancestry goes back to England, and they were some of the first people to come to the United States, and colonists, and, and he comes from a very long, strong line of, of English history. And um, the Pecks, there's still a lot of Pecks in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. And he left Rehoboth, Massachusetts. He went to Vermont. And he was, by trade, a blacksmith. Do you know what a blacksmith is? Yeah, yeah. person who makes like, from like metal. And yeah, he stuff. works with metal. And he was he was known for being able to make razor blades. And he was believed to make the sharpest, thinnest razor blades. At least that's one of the things I've read about him. Okay. So yeah. he joined the church in 1833. Yeah. Do you remember when the church was founded? Do you know what year the church was founded? Established? Eighteen thirty. April sixth, eighteen thirties was when the church was officially organized, and he joined three years later. He was taught the gospel and baptized by a man named Lyman Johnson, who was an early member of the church and missionary. Well, Martin, according to the story, I'm still working on confirming the story, but according to the story, Martin was part of an anti-Mormon group. And he heard that the Mormons were coming and having a fireside, and he put together this group, and they were going to go and, and break up yeah. and mess it all up. And he came up on the group and heard the voice of Lyman Johnson and was immediately converted to the Spirit. He felt the Spirit. Was that, was that when they were singing and they had come up over the top and were going to, like, kill them? I don't know that. Is that that story? I, I don't know. I haven't heard that story. I, I imagine it's probably, there's probably a handful of those stories. There's, there's quite a few. With all the anti-Mormons out there that wanted to get the... You know. Well, I think Lyman was part of that. And that might be... And Lyman was preaching blink, all over the not. place. So it could be this one. It could be a different one. But that sounds but very similar to similar. that story. When it's pretty neat. And blacksmiths are big guys, too. Uh, yeah, Martin was... I mean, he was tall. I, I have a picture of him standing that I'll have to find and send you. But he, he was tall, probably close to six foot. <laughs> And if the average height is five foot six, he was a tall man. He's a big guy. Um, and hence all of your, my cousins, your brothers, you know, oh, they're yeah. all mm -hmm. six two, six know. three. Six five. Daniel Lee. Yeah. Daniel I'm the shortest two. one, and I'm your dad, three. my dad. Um, my mom is shorter than me, but of the of the children, the pecs. of the pecs, I'm the shortest peck child at five foot ten, and my sisters are are both just shy of six foot. Uh, Katie is five eleven, Dora is five eleven and a half, Daniel Lee is six foot. Kenneth is the tallest at six five. So did their children. They had a child named William Page Peck, who was born about a year after they joined the church. He was born in 1834. William Page is the son that you come through. He's your fourth great grandfather. They crossed the plains. They went to Ohio. And in Ohio, there's this place called Kirtland, right? Where they built the first temple, right? It was in Kirtland, Ohio. That temple is still there. And um, he was a blacksmith in Kirtland, and people got to know him really well. And he became friends with people like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and Neil K. Whitney. Do you know who Neil K. Whitney was? He was an early bishop in the church. And at that time in Kirtland, any man who was preaching, like a missionary or a minister, had to have a license, a special license that they carried in their pocket to show the government and the police officers that they were allowed to preach. He signed Newell K. Whitney's preacher's license, giving Newell K. Whitney permission to preach. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah. So eventually, some of the saints go to Missouri, and, and he was supposed to go with Zion's camp, but got sick and couldn't go. So he helped organize Camp Kirtland and ended up in Indiana for a while, which your dad and I are still trying to figure out all the details around that story. But he was known, one of his gifts was for healing. He could heal people. 
and there's a story, and we have multiple accounts of witnesses seeing this, but one of his sons, I believe it was Edwin, his oldest son, at one point in Ohio, was run over by a heavy laden wagon. His leg was cut open. Really bad. Really, really bad. And he went and he blessed his son and healed his son. And by the end of the day, depending on, on the account you read, it varies. Some people say it was within hours. Some people says it was by the end of the day. But some point by the end of the day, the wound was healed. The broken leg was healed so that barely a scar was visible. And there are multiple accounts of him healing people. And it comes up in his patriarchal blessing and several of the patriarchal blessings of his sons that this gift of healing is one of his gifts. So really astounding gift to have and to be able to employ that for his family and for his friends and for the good of the church. He used his gifts to build up the church. Wow. He was eventually set apart as a high priest and was one of the early high priests in the church and was a missionary. He served a mission with his son Edwin from 1854 to 1855 and they went to the Northeast. He went back to Vermont, Massachusetts and taught the gospel to his family members. One of their mission companions for a little while was John Taylor. Do you know who John Taylor was? Yeah. Yeah, he was the third prophet of the church. So he actually served part of his mission with John Taylor and they came back. He, so he had crossed the plains to Utah and Brigham Young said, go back. East, Martin, and he went, yeah, sure, I'll go back east. And he went back east with his son and then crossed the plains a second time. He crossed the plains twice. I know, right? The first time he came to Utah was in 1848. By that time, Susan had already passed away and he had remarried a woman named Mary Thorne. And they had multiple children together. And they brought their family to Utah as part of the Heber C. Kimball Company in 1848. And he was in a group, so you'd have this big company of people and there would be a hundred wagons and they would break it down into groups. So Heber C. Kimball was the captain of the entire company. And underneath him, there were captains of 100 and they were in charge of a hundred groups of, of wagons. And so his captain of 100 was Harry Harriman or Henry Harriman. And then underneath that was a captain of 50 who was John Pack, P-A-C-K. And then Martin was a captain of 10. He was in charge of 10 wagons of families. It, it would kind of be like being a bishop, how you have so many families and a ward and the bishop's in charge. And then there's a state president who's in charge of so many different wards and then a district leader and so on and so forth. So he would be kind of like in the pioneer time, kind of like a bishop over this, this group of pioneers. He was a captain of 10 and he made his way here and he set up his blacksmith shop, or blacksmith shop, not far from where we're at right now, actually. Wow. His blacksmith shop, and maybe later your dad will give you, be able to drive you by it. But if you take North Temple, Dad, second uh, to Second West, there's a crossroads, and there's a Maverick station on this corner, on the northwest corner. That's our old family property where really? the Maverick gas station is. So every time I fill up gas to go home to Idaho, I stop by our our our, our, our homeland. Is there a restroom? Mm. Bushes. There is, there's one napkin? way over there, but I don't know. Family property in Utah is not far from here. It's only a couple miles from here. So maybe your dad will give you a chance to or take a, a, a drive by there. Next time we come back, we can see where they lived yeah. and the and church they went to. And um, and he became a bishop. He was a bishop of the, I believe it was the 19th ward <laughs> for a time. And uh, really served his community. And at one point, he eventually was... Um, uh, appointed to be the uh, sealer of weights and measures in Utah. So it was his job to, to help determine how much um, a pound of flour would be worth, or a pound of grain would be worth, or how much a 2,000 pound pig might be worth. That'd be a really big pig. <laughs> That'd be like an elephant sized pig. But you know, it was his job to figure out the weights and measures and how much things were worth, how much a, a pound of metal would be worth. And so that was his job up, in, up until not long before he died. And um, he had lots and lots and lots of children. In fact, I've met some of his other grandchildren so he is my fifth great grandfather, your sixth great grandfather, but I've met one of our cousins who he was their great grandfather. Not five greats, not four greats, one great. So think about it, think about it. Your grandpa, Frank, is 
your dad, right? Or no, he's your grandpa. He's your dad's dad. And then beyond that, Grandpa Bud, he's your great grandpa. I met someone who Martin was their great grandpa. Like Bud is your great grandpa. Dang. I know, right? <laughs> right? They come, uh, that, that cousin, she comes from a, uh, one of his youngest sons from one of his latest, later wives. So a little bit different, but yeah, there are lots of us who are descended from this one faithful man. And it says, oh, he was a good, if ever a good man lived. And it was true. He was a very, very good man. So. Where is Gentile Valley in Idaho? Didn't they live there for a while? Uh, part of them lived in some of his kids are born there. Um, I'm not sure. Or grandkids. Where valley is. I've read about no? it, but I'm not sure which valley that's in. I'd have to go back and double check because I've looked it up before, but I can't remember. Um, so I live in Snake <laughs> Snake River Valley. Sounds safe. And, <laughs> and then there's Marsh Valley, which is on this side, and then there's Happy Valley, which is that way. I'm not sure where Gentile Valley is. So I'll have to double check. No. Um, no but any questions about yeah. Grandpa Martin? No. no. Was he ever uh, ran a question? Was he at the prophet's private funeral? Uh, prob you know? Probably. Um, I don't know for sure, but I know he was, he, even though he was never called to be an apostle, he interacted with the upper echelons quite regularly. Um, I mean, and his children married into this family. We believe that William Page, the one we come through, was named after Hiram Page. And we think that, or we know that um, George Buchanan, who's buried right over there, he's George Buchanan, one of his father-in-laws. And we know that there was a close relationship with, between him and Brigham. I've got letters between him and Brigham, copies of letters that he wrote to Brigham and vice versa. And we know that there was lots of interaction. So if he wasn't at the private funeral, it would kind of surprise me a little bit. Someone, did, they, did anyone ever talk about him being one of the last remaining to know Joseph? Because it's 78, 18 years old. He would have been. Maybe, maybe he was a little too old. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he, I know when, when Porter Rockwell died, he was known to be like the oldest living, the oldest uh, member of the church. Not in age wise, but in terms of length of being a member of the church. Yeah. Rockwell died, yeah. So he died, in, in, he was baptized in 1833. So he's also from the early early days of the church, and he survived the, you know, all the apostasy that took place between 1836. And